The best way to reduce fees for financial advisors, the best way is when the fees are paid from an IRA, have that IRA distribution taxable as 1099 to the investor. Like everything else that comes out of a, an IRA is taxable to the investor, the IRA owner. IRA distributions to pay for investment management fees are not taxable. <laughs> I was just reading Michael Kitsis the other day. And uh, look, I'm a fan of Kitsis. I don't want any debates on this whatsoever. But he saw a, uh, he posts on LinkedIn. I don't know if he wrote the blog piece or something like that, but there's six uh, financial firms had PLRs independently issued. That's private letter ruling, PLR, saying that uh, fees from IRAs are not taxable, hey puppy, to the investor or the account owner. And so basically the IRS is pretty clear that now you can't use a PLR to state explicitly that that is the law of the land, but pretty doggone close. And uh, <laughs> I, man, I put a comment on there and said, that's great. That's how you can keep the, I'm trying to watch my words here. You can keep the fees astronomically high because you can hide the fact that is his money coming from an IRA as a distribution, even though it's not feed or taxable. If you were to have a 1099 of 20,000 bucks, let's just use that for an example. Hell, 5,000 bucks, I don't care. So I said, Mrs. Smith, you owe your broker, your investment guy, your financial planner, your investment counselor, your life coach, whatever they call themselves, uh, charge you $5,000 of fees, you need to clear that as a taxable income because it's coming from your IRA, which is where the bulk of most people's money is other than home equity. <laughs> what do you think? So, now, not only do I not get uh, to keep that money, I got to pay tax on that money. Uh, <laughs> Do you think Mrs. Smith would be as inclined to pay a $5,000 fee because it's costing more than $5,000? She'd have to pay the tax on that $5,000 distribution and she'd have to pay the fee itself. So let's just say it costs her $5,700 as opposed to $5,000. So what's her net fee in that regard? Well, you can figure that out. Freaking crazy, man. It just shows you how the industry It just shows you how the industry is lock, stock, and barrel in the swamp, for sure. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. Uh, well, Josh, don't you see that the investment firm who's receiving the money, the guy, he has to pay tax on an income. If I took 10000 out to buy a car of my IRA, all right, I have to pay tax on the IRA distribution. I give that $10,000 to the car dealer. He's got to be taxed on the sale, does he not? Yes, he does. Double tax, you could say, or just taxable as it should be. We gave you tax deferred assets. You pulled the money out for the purchase of whatever it is. You should pay tax on that. If you use that money for whatever reason it is, buy the car, buy the house, Oh, but there are exceptions for first-time home buyers. Okay, that's not me. That's not you. Why do we have this exception for investment management services? When we know, we know the fees are the number one impediment to freaking quality investment success. Everybody, oh man, and I love my man Nick Murray. I love this guy. He's such an impact on me. And you should subscribe to his newsletter, Nick Murray Newsletter. And... Uh, NMI, I think, Nick Murray Interactive. But he talks about how you're worth, you as an advisor, are worth well more than the 1% you're charging. I unequivocally disagree with that. The idea is that you as an investor can't do this on your own because you'll make the big mistake, which is what Nick calls it, 
which is you're going to sell at the bottom and buy at the high. And I just don't think that happens. Yes, there are some people who do that. I think they're professionals more than anybody who does that. I don't think just average Mrs. and Mr. Smith are doing that that often. Now look, I had a guy the other day, and probably for the fourth time this year, this is why I don't take people on a regular basis on to talk to them every four, three months or something like that because it bores me to death. You know, this is like the fourth time we've had this discussion this year. That's why I don't do like that. Uh, you know, I, well, I forgot what it was, but we, I don't know. Somehow I, it was one of those things where I'll pay a regular basis, just have like a quarterly discussion. I, I don't know how, it was, I, I'm not sure how that came to be, but I, that's not the way I want to do business because it bores me to no end. He's sitting there saying, markets are up, markets are down. What should I do? The answer is always nothing, nothing. Unless you're losing sleep at night, then do something. Markets up or down for the last three months has no, nothing to do with your long-term performance as an investor. You should do nothing based on that. Nothing. Unless you can't sleep at night. That's what I told this guy. I said, no, nah, man, if you, you lose sleep, no. Then don't do anything. But the, and I used to have to do this a lot back in my pre-self-employed uh, uh, days. But markets are at a all-time high. <laughs> I, I just markets are always at an all-time high for heaven's sake man we want markets forever will be at an all-time high it's just the nature of the markets growing in value I, I don't get why that's so thing well markets that are all-time high relative to earnings huh, a little bit i mean definitely not all-time high relative to earnings they're high or than historical earnings that doesn't mean anything in the overall scheme of things. It might mean historical earnings relative to the price of P.E. ratios were too low. I don't know. By the end of the day, okay, so what are you going to do? They were at an all-time high or historical high in 2009 and 2010, too. I, what's the alternative? Bonds? Well, what's bonds? You think the stock market is at an all-time high. What do you think the bonds are? Real estate? Anyway, so I sit there and I say, so hey, that's the exception rule. The vast majority of people I talk to don't move in, up and down like this. They just don't. They say, I'm in it. I'm just going to ride it and not look at it. And that's what you got to do. You got to say to yourself, hey, I, <laughs> which is why I love the barbell. Everyone says from an efficiency perspective, there's better approaches than the barbell. Well, there's better approaches on many things on a spreadsheet, but when it comes to the reality, People have two thought processes. One is their cash money that they're going to need to spend for the next three years or so. And one is their investment money, which they won't need to spend until four years out. So what the market does today on that second bucket is simply irrelevant to their current needs, if that makes sense. Which is what makes the two-bucket retirement strategy so, so freaking awesome. Yeah, it sucks. I'm in 2009. The market just got hammered. But I got this another two and a half years of cash sitting here. It's idle where I can tap into to pay the bills over the next couple of years. If things don't change, well, I'll have to revisit. But historically speaking, and yes, I hate to have to use historically because you don't know historically will equate to futuristically. But what else are you going to do, man? I mean, my gosh, you're sitting there historically speaking. The markets have come back. That may or may not happen, but... Uh, the one thing is if you have no debt, it almost won't matter. Because if you don't have debt, you can always tighten your belt other ways. So, at the end of the day, you use the best, the best methodology that you have, best, best methodology that you have. And the best methodology that you have is holding tight when the markets are going up and down. Because that's what they do. They go up and down. Not to know that going into investing is to either be ignorant or pretend that there's some other alternative that no one else knows about. And just for the record, don't tell anybody this, there is no other alternative. There is a variable annuity, index annuity, hedge fund, investment strategy of any sort that give you market-like returns without market-like risk. That's all there is to it. None. All the smartest guys in the world my man Amar just sent me his book, The Quant Who Broke Wall Street. I, I mean, I'm, we'll see if I ever get around to reading it. Stuff kind of bores me, to be honest with you. 
at the end of the day, it, quants can't predict human behavior. They just can't. So you can have all the mechanisms of quants, and quant is just a, they analyze stuff fundamentally relative to what their computer models say, but just look at LTCM, long-term capital management. Literally the smartest guys in the room. Uh, they went kaput because their method didn't work. It's always easy to say that's the guy whose method worked. Well, yeah, but no one knew that in, high, in, in foresight. So was it lucky? Was it skill? Well, we'll never know because we just don't know. There's on any statistical analysis, there's always going to be an outlier. There's always going to be a Warren Buffett. And there'll always be an LTCM. So the question is, who is that person in advance? You just don't know. So because you don't know, it's literally a speculative gamble to say, this guy, I forgot the guy's name, this quant will be the guy that makes me trillions and trillions of dollars. That guy, the LTC guy, LTCM guy, is going to be the guy that goes bankrupt. You don't know that. They don't know that. It's impossible to know that. So in hindsight, when the quant that beats Wall Street, it's like, oh, man, I should have seen that. You, know, you and everybody else, he just got lucky. No, he didn't get lucky. Yeah, he got lucky. There's always going to be an outlier, man. Always. That's how his probabilities work. You always have the tail end. Be a fat tail, skinny tails, it doesn't matter. You're always going to have someone on the outside. Doesn't mean they're better. Doesn't mean they're worse. It just means there's always be that person. So the issue to have with this, with investment fees, you're paying somebody a fee to manage your money to keep you from making the big mistake is what Nick Murray and others say. Even Vanguard has this thing where they say, oh, we show you that having an advisor will keep you in the markets when markets go south. I'm like, who is the, I, I mean, I've never seen a study on this, but just my own experience, talking to professionals versus talking to non-industry people the professionals are the ones who are bouncing around jabbing jabbing back up jabbing jabbing back up they're the ones who don't make any money because they're too busy being active with a newfound strategy that they read online or something like that or heard from the quant who broke wall street it's the it's the long-term buy and hold people the ones that make the money so i don't think there's any basis at all to say that the average investor moves money uh, when the markets are down, gets out after the market's taught hit, and gets back in once they go back up. I've seen that on occasion. I'm trying, I have. I've seen that on occasion. I've been in this business a long time. On occasion does not anywhere come close to the majority of time, not even close. So at the end of the day, if investment professionals were, were, were true in, in a, yeah, I'm trying to just, again, be light here on a Christmas. I would say they should not get tax-exempt favor treatment on people taking distributions from IRAs in which to pay the investment management fees. It's a, it's a lobbying coup that the ICI, Investment Company Institute, and other firms to include insurance companies have been able to perpetuate on the taxpayer. Again, if I were to take an IRA distribution to do anything else with, it doesn't matter what it is other than give it to charity, I would pay tax on that distribution. If I'm taking an IRA distribution and that person who received that money would pay tax as income on the payment I made to him for the services provided. Landscaping, if I wanted him to pay me, if I want to pay him landscaping, he, I would pay tax on distribution. He would pay tax on my income I'm providing to him for the landscape service he provided. If I bought a car, like I already said, the only time that's excluded is charitable distributions to some degree, and even I don't like, and then investment management. It's nice to be king. It's nice to be in the swamp. It's not right, though. I don't see it.